You may be seated. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Happy 4th of July weekend, I guess. You know, we take a lot of things for granted in this country. Pastor Sonny's talking about passing a history test that I'm afraid I might not would pass myself. So good for you, Pastor Sonny. We're glad that you're here. So uh, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord, as I said today. So we've got a lot going on today. If you're a visitor, you picked a good day to be here. We've got a, a, a celebration this afternoon, so it's good to see you today. If you haven't and you're a visitor, stop by our Welcome Center. Please do so. We have a free gift for you. There's a Connect card in the pew in front of you. We'd like for you to fill that out if you don't mind and drop that by over there. Pick up your free gift uh, just for coming by. Uh, I want to make you aware of a few announcements real quick. Um, we've got a lot to do today, <clears throat> so I want to jump right into them. Each year we do a backpack hero program or school supplies drive if you want to call it that uh, there's a flyer in your bulletin that explains it this is an opportunity that our church takes advantage of to reach out to those whether they're in our church or in our community to give them school supplies that's a that's a big burden at times on folks uh, and and our church does a wonderful job at trying to reach out to those it will give you a list the the, the flyer will give you a list of items that we could sure use put them in a backpack Put them in the bin out front under the table there. If you can't do that, you can do monetary donations if you'd like uh, to support this. Uh, or if you know someone who is in need and maybe they're not wanting to ask help uh, or willing to, to say anything, call the church office. Let us know. Uh, we'll be talking more and more going on uh, through the summer for this, uh, but it goes all the way through July the, the 22nd. So uh, time is of the essence to get started with that. Also, uh, July the 15th, we're going to be celebrating Pastor's Appreciation Day. We have a wonderful pastor and his family who serve the Lord at our church. You have no idea if you don't go to other churches how blessed we are. If you don't visit and, and you don't see other churches, and I'm not saying you should, I'm just telling you to take my word for it. We are a blessed people to have the, fa the pastor and family that we do uh, serving God here in our midst and so we're going to be celebrating them they've been here over 10 years now they came with babies and now they got grown daughters uh, so time flies by uh, and so uh, there, there's a flyer in there also to talk about that if you would like to send them a letter of appreciation they've got their address and all that please consider doing that uh, lift them up in your prayers uh, keep keep them on the front line of your prayer so that God can continue to use them uh, as I mentioned already our family and friends day is a, is a family outing that we're going to be having this afternoon of immediately following the service that's why the tent and the caution tape is out there we'd love for you to stay and be a part of this if you planned on it or if you didn't plan on it we'd love for you to stay come out and be a part of this it's a great opportunity to mingle with people of like faith in a very relaxed atmosphere as hot as it's going to be, I guarantee you it will be relaxed atmosphere. You're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to be uptight out there other than just hot. But it's a good day. There's there's water events for the kids. I think somebody's gonna get dunked or slimed. Uh, some of the leadership. As long as I'm not on that list, it's a good day. But it will be a fun day for you to be a part of this. So please plan on staying. Those of you that don't know, we had vacation Bible school this week. This is a huge event. And if y'all want to go ahead and start making your way this way, Pastor Jeff, uh, this is a huge event that our church undertakes each year. It is an immense amount of manpower to get it set up each day, to get it set up before we start, and then to keep it going each day. Uh, so I'll probably say it again here in a minute, but if you see a worker, no matter their age, that helped during Vacation Bible School, shake their hand, hug their necks, tell them how much you appreciate all they did, for your children this week. This is a huge, huge event. Uh, and we had 139 kids come through uh, throughout the week. Now, a lot of that was repeat children coming over and over again. So this was a very, very big event uh, to try to house, and it took a lot of manpower to do so. So they're going to bless you with a song real quick. All right, guys. Aren't they cute? These are just some of our little people that came. We ministered to over how many was was it, Pastor Jeff? 139 kids came through this church this past week. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Y'all can clap too. 
And the theme of this week was Jesus Rescues. And what a message of hope that was for our little people. But it's not only for them, it's for us. So enjoy this. I didn't know it would be this hard. I didn't think I could fall so far. So if it took this much effort to get them on and off stage, imagine what the whole week was like. So I say that to say, again, hug a neck of one of these VBS workers, these, these coordinators. Pastor Jeff, 92, three volunteers. That is a huge accomplishment. We, are, we appreciate all that you've done. If you would... Let us all stand, and if you get your tithes and offerings out, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Again, I want to read our scripture for the year. It comes from Philippians 4, 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory. I reminded them the first ser in the first service that a lot of times we see the word riches and need in the same sentence, and we think of money. What if that need you got is a breakthrough? 
What if that need you have is a lost loved one saved? To have a life-changing event that you are in desperate need of and you can't seem to get there. Well, as I've said, Pastor Mark has gone before the Lord and got this scripture for us for the whole year. So to those of you that God's speaking, he's promising to meet your need this year. He's promising to minister to where you are. I want you to keep that in mind. Lift your tithes and offerings to the Lord as we pray together. Father in heaven, I bless you, and I thank you so much for all that you've done in this house, all that you're doing, all that you've done this week. God, I bless you again, Lord, for the things that you've done this week in Vacation Bible School, for the, the help and the strength you gave the workers, Lord. You, you supplied strength. You supplied willpower each day, God, and, and they're still here today giving of themselves, working again today. And I praise you and thank you for giving them the strength and giving us them. God, I bless you and thank you for all that you're doing. And I pray that you would move in this house today. God, we come before you and ask you, Lord, that you would do in this service what you've been doing already today, that you would continue to minister and continue to touch and strengthen and uplift. I pray that you would let the anointing be heavily on our pastor again in this service, Lord, that he would be able to speak the words that you have for him to speak, Lord, to us, that you would give us ears to hear, God, that you would meet us right where we are and that you would touch us and bring us closer to you. Give us the strength to put out of our minds and out of our hearts yesterday and the days before, the, the things that we've carried this week. I pray that you'd give us the strength to lay them aside so that we can hear what you have to say today. God, I pray that your will will be done in this service. I pray, God, as we bring our tithes and offerings, that you would use it for your kingdom, that you would bless it and multiply it, God. Do with it whatever you choose, Father, for we bless you and thank you for it's all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd bring. Almighty God, we give you praise, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, as we come before you this day. Again, invited your Holy Spirit into the temple which you have purchased. Lord, we ask today, God, that you would create in us a new heart, a clean heart. Renew in us a right spirit. Help us, Lord, indeed, to become more aware of your presence. That everywhere that we go is the temple of the Almighty, that there you are. We invite you along. Help us to become more aware of your presence when we watch things we shouldn't be watching. Help us become more aware of your presence before we open our mouth to speak. Lord, I pray this morning, God, you'd be great every heart, every mind, and spirit to receive of you this holy word. Lord, as your servant, I confess today, I'm nothing, Lord. I pray that your will be done, God, that you would use me simply as a tool in your hand. However you see fit, let it be for your glory. Let it be your word that goes forth today, not the word of a man. And I pray that you and you alone are seen and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we sang that song in the first service, it became just aware in my spirit how much we need that that little phrase. And sometimes they things like that just get stuck in my head, I guess. But let us become more aware of your presence. We're in this series cleaning house and inviting the Holy Spirit to come and live. And I'm convinced that you're no different than I am. If, if I can't get the house clean, if it gets infested with something that, that makes me uncomfortable to stay there and I, I can't deal with it or I can't get victory over that, I'm not going to stay there. As much as I may love the home, I'll, I'll move some other place. And I'm convinced that God wants to do more in your life, just like he does mine, than what we've allowed him reign to do. Too often we carelessly, this isn't in my notes this morning, just this song, just help us become more aware of your presence. Lord, every place that I go, whether it's the restaurant or standing in line at the grocery store or at Walmart or at home when nobody else is around, let me be more aware of your presence so that the thoughts of my mind don't get ahead of me, so that I don't click on sites that I shouldn't be looking at. So that I don't turn on stuff on the television that I have no business inviting the Holy Spirit. Let me become more aware of your presence. As David said, 
I want to hide your word in my heart that I've not sinned against you. If you ever just, man, I pray, that's my prayer this morning. If I could ever just get to the point where I don't forget even for a moment that God wants to live in me. I, I'm convinced that it would alter every decision I make. That it would change and alter for the glory of God. Every word that comes flying out of my mouth. Oh Lord indeed help us. Become more aware of your presence. Can I ask you this morning. Is there anybody in here that's without sin? None of us in here are perfect. The Bible makes that clear. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. I just wanted to check as I did in the first service and see if we had any liars in the house. <laughs> so I know what to preach next. We know we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. I want to open up with just a couple of little stories. In 1884, a young man died leaving his grieving parents behind. True story. And they decided they wanted to establish a memorial to their son. So they went to Harvard University to speak with the president of the university, Mr. Charles Elliott at the time. When they walked in, they didn't have any special appearance that would make them look like they were wealthy or even educated. So Mr. Elliott, the president, was not very impressed. When they told him that they wanted to establish a memorial to their son, he quickly assessed and assumed that the best they would be able to do would be set up a scholarship fund or something along those lines. And he began to tell them what they could do there. And they stopped him and said, well, we were thinking of something a little more substantial than that. Perhaps a building in his name. In a very patronizing and unbelieving manner, Mr. Elliott brushed off that idea because he knew that common people like this couldn't afford a building. Certainly not at Harvard University. Then he became frustrated and dismissed them and said that he had other pressing business and other meeting to attend to. Well, the next year, Charles Elliott learned that this plain common couple had gone elsewhere and established in 1884, established a $26 million memorial named Leland Stanford Jr. University, or better known today as Stanford University. This quick judgment went down in history as one of the worst decisions ever made by a Harvard president. Another little story I want to share and then I'll get to it. A teacher by the name of Dodie Gadian, who had been a teacher for over 13 years, decided to travel across America during her summer break to see the sights that she had taught about for years. Traveling alone in a truck, pulling a small camper trailer, she took the open road. And one afternoon, as she was rounding a curve on I-5 near Sacramento, California, in rush hour traffic, the water hose blew on her truck. She was tired, worried, scared, and all alone. In spite of the traffic jam that she had caused, no one cared enough to stop and help her. Leaning up against her trailer, she began to pray. And she prayed, God... Send me an angel, preferably one with mechanical experience. <laughs> and within less than five minutes, a huge Harley Davidson motorcycle drove up, ridden by an enormous man sporting a long black hair and a scraggly thick beard, tattoos all over his arms. Acting as though he knew exactly what he was doing, he got off his bike and without even glancing or saying a word at Dodie, went to work on the truck. A few minutes later, he boldly stepped out into the path of an 18-wheeler and convinced the driver to attach a tow chain to the frame of the disabled truck and trailer and pull it off the freeway onto a side street where he went back to work. The school teacher, too intimidated and dumbfounded to say anything, especially when she read the paralyzing words on the back of his leather jacket, Hell's Angels, and gave the chapter in California. When he finished working, she finally got up the courage to say thank you, but couldn't find the words to say anything else. Noticing her surprise at the whole ordeal, he looked her straight in the eye and mumbled, Ma'am, don't judge a book by its cover. You never know who you're talking to. And with that, he smiled, closed the hood of her truck, got on his Harley, and without even a single wave, drove off as quick as he 
appeared. The Bible says that we entertain angels unaware sometimes. I love the fact that he said, man, don't judge a book by its cover. But aren't we all guilty of that? This morning as I continue this series, this is, this is what I want to deal with today is the, the spirit of judgment or this judgmental spirit that lives even inside of many in the church. So many of us, even without being aware of it, cast judgment on people almost every day of our life. I'm just talking to the church again. This whole series is reminding the church that you and I are called. Know ye not that your body is the temple? No, know ye not that the Holy Spirit desires to live in you? If he's going to be comfortable, then you have to give him the keys without a lease. Many of us give God the keys at the altar and ask him to invite, invite him into our heart. But then it's though we're the landlord, we, we want to keep a lease. Tell the Lord what he can do and what he can't do, how far he can go and what we're willing to do and, and, and how far we'll go in our walk with God and, and maybe even give him free reigns until it becomes uncomfortable. Until he wants to move something, change something that, that we've become attached to, sin. I'm convinced today that God wants to do more in your life than you've ever seen. I'm convinced today that God wants to bring revival not only to you, but to your household and to your community. I'm convinced today that God is looking for people just like he was 2,000 years ago in the upper room. People who are hungry and desperate for a move of God. Who maybe without even comprehending what exactly it might look like, would be so willing and so desperate and so hungry for a move of God. That they would surrender themselves in the upper room. They prayed for 10 days. I don't think they stopped for lunch or breakfast. I believe they were more hungry for God than they were anything this world had to offer. When people get that desperate remove of God, it's then they'll hand over the keys and all control and all ownership. God, here I am. Have your way, Lord. I'm convinced today that the Holy Spirit is desiring to clean house in some of our lives to birth exactly that, a revival, a renewing, an awakening. I don't have to tell you there's a lost and dying world outside the front doors of this church. Let me narrow the focus because I think sometimes we overgeneralize we talk about the world. There's a lost and dying community in Red Bank, South Carolina. The place that God has chosen to place you, the place that God has chosen to birth a church. The church isn't the building, by the way, it's you again I'm referring to, me. How will we reach the world? It's not by building another building and calling it a church. It's not through programs. I praise God for programs. What's going to reach the lost is the living God living in and through his people still today. The presence of the Almighty said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. Some of us are praying for our families and, and, and crying and weeping, staying up at night, praying that, that God would touch them. Know ye not that you're the temple? I'm telling you that if you'd let God have his way and give God not only the, the keys, but sign over the deed. And you'd begin to let the Holy Spirit live in you like he desires to live in you. God would be glorified through your life in such a way that it would draw all men to you. Have you ever noticed when you turn a light on at night, the moths come and you don't have to put a sign up saying vacancy. You, you don't have to go and post a sign up by the driveway letting the bugs know that, that you've got the lights turned on in the backyard. No, they're drawn to it. They can see it for miles away. I've come to realize that men and women, even those that profess to want nothing to do with God, are drawn like moths to a flame to people that are on fire for Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you what people have no interest and no appetite for. It's religion. And the spirit of religion has plagued the church long before the 20th century. In the days of Jesus Christ, it was religion that Christ came and upset the apple cart because they were so entrenched in religion, they had no room for Christ. I believe today that God wants to revive his church. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to Matthew chapter 7. All of this comes back to this. 
if the church is ever going to be the church. The Bible says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Living water. If the church is ever going to be the church, then we'll have to sign over the lease to ownership. Let God have his way. And Lord, clean out every area of my heart, every area of my life that does not bring glory and honor to you. This, don't judge a book by its cover. Part of the reason I wanted to share that story in particular is because as I read that, immediately I thought about, you know, we entertain angels unaware. But I caught myself as I'm preparing for this lesson on Judging. When I read that part about hell's angels on the back of his jacket, immediately I thought, well, God wouldn't use a man like that, not, not in the hell's angels. Who am I to say what God would use and wouldn't use? Conviction set in. Here I am preparing to preach a lesson on judgment and just that quick casting judgment on something I'm reading. I'm not innocent. Every one of us are just as guilty. I know that God used a donkey to save his prophet. This thing convicted me this morning because I began to think, let me just talk about Balaam for a moment. I'm going to get to this text. The prophet of the Lord, Balaam, was on his way to get himself into trouble and the judgment of God stood just around the corner but Balaam couldn't see it. And the angel of the Lord stood there with sword drawn ready to kill Balaam for crossing a line if you will. Paraphrasing. If you want more information on the story I'll give it to you later. But as the judgment of God stood just around the corner and Balaam didn't know it Balaam couldn't see it. Balaam's donkey saw something that Balaam couldn't see. And the donkey refused to go forward and Balaam began to beat the donkey. Till finally the donkey began to speak literally audibly. In essence said, haven't I been good to you? Why are you beating me? It was the mercy of God speaking through that donkey. Because just around the corner, if you will, stood judgment. And the grace of God and the judgment of God stood toe-to-toe -to -toe that day, battling for a life, battling for a soul. I've come to tell you, I, I feel like that old donkey. I, I'm just a man. I'm not God. But the judgment of God looms around the corner, and many of us have heard it time and time again. The grace of God, the mercy of God stands toe-to-toe -to -toe with that day of judgment, giving you and I warning that God wants to deal with the impurities and the unholiness in the vessel that is you. And many of us have sat in church, and, and we've let the sermons go over our head. Not that we didn't comprehend it, we just chose not to receive it in our heart. We heard it with our ears, but it went in one and went out the other in the judgment of God. I'm telling you, dear friend, don't, don't you know the word? The Bible says that not everybody that says to me, and the Lord said this, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Many will say, many will say in that day, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't I come to church every time the doors were open? Didn't I preach the gospel for you? Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. You, you wouldn't surrender. You, you, you wouldn't let me clean that area of your life. You held on to it. You continued to work iniquity. You continued to practice that sin. Brothers and sisters, God is holy. He's always been holy. He's never lowered his standard. I don't care what generation we're in or what man may preach a different message. There is no message but the holy God, Jesus Christ. God desires to cleanse the temple. God desires to cleanse your life. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you, sh you judge... You shall be judged, and with what measure you use, it shall be measured to you again, or it's going to be used on you. And why behold thou the mote, or the little speck of dust in your brother's eye, but consider not the beam, the telephone pole that's in your own eye. 
How will you say to your brother, let, let me help you get that little speck, that mote out of your eye, and behold, not a beam in your own eye? You hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of your own eye, then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the speck or the mote in your brother's eye. Before I get into it, it says, judge not lest you be judged. But before I get into that, I want to deal with an issue that has pervaded the church. A tactic the enemy is all too good at in twisting and manipulating the word of God and turning the word of God even against God's people. How many have heard somebody say things like, don't judge me. You're not supposed to judge. It's amazing to me that even people that profess to be atheists don't say that when people try and bring up scripture. Well, you're not supposed to judge me. Well, you're not supposed to believe in that book that you're quoting. It's amazing to me that people that throw that out and, and we've backed ourselves into a corner thinking that we can't call wrong, wrong and right, right. The term political correctness, this new term, that's basically what it is. Don't call something wrong that's wrong because it might offend somebody. We're judging them. If we, no, no, it's not the same judgment. This came up in our Wednesday night Bible study a little bit. I, I want to deal with this issue just a little bit before we get into it. Uh, let me give you an illustration. I, I thought about it like this. Let's say a police officer pulls you over for speeding. Walks up to the window and you say, don't judge me. You, you don't know what I've been through today. You don't know what's in my heart. You don't know what's going on in my life right now. You don't know all the things that I've been through. And if he's polite, he may say, no, sir, Pastor Crumpton, I sure don't, but I know you were speeding. And for that, sir, I'm going to give you this citation. People love to throw out, don't judge me. The Bible says that we'll know them by their fruit. The Bible says that we are to judge one another in deeds and works. I don't want to get too far sidetracked there, but how can, how can you, in the contradictory, how can you judge and then not judge at the same time? There's a difference between the outside and the inside. When we judge the outside, we judge the fruit. We're not judging what's on the inside. I'll get to this more in just a moment. It'll make more sense in a minute, but John chapter 7, verse 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. The Bible says we were not to be unequally yoked. How can you, how can you say that without judging? Because you call it what it is, and you refuse to judge. I, I want to look at something in verse 3. It says, why behold thou the mote that's in your brother's eye? The, the scripture doesn't say, why do you pretend like there's something in his eye? He says, why do you notice the speck in his eye, but you fail to acknowledge what's in your own life? I, I point this out because I want you to understand, it's not wrong to notice that somebody else has something going on in their life. This isn't judgment when you notice. When you, when you see an apple on a tree, you don't have to be a scientist to know it's an apple tree. You recognize it by the fruit. There are some things in life that are just obvious, but you can refuse to, to judge it beyond that. I can call it as I, I can look at the outside without judging the inside. Leave the judgment on the inside to God. Judge the appearance on the outside. We, we shouldn't be unequally yoked, and that's more than just a marriage thing. You shouldn't be running around with other people that's going to pull you away from God. Well, isn't that judgment? No. You don't have to wait till a snake bites you to figure out whether or not it's poison. You can just stay away from it from the beginning. You don't have to judge it to know it's a snake. So here's what a definition of judgment in this context would be more close to mean. To size up with the intent 
of writing someone off. How many times we size somebody up and go ahead and write them off in our mind? Let me give you an example. We see the guy standing by the road with the sign, we'll work for food. How many times have we sized him up? Oh, he's just a lazy bum. Probably out here taking advantage of everybody. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. But you sized him up and already wrote him off. You already made up your mind. To size up and write off, to condemn or to find fault, this is what it means to judge. To notice that someone's not working is not the same thing as going the extra step. When this was brought up in our Wednesday Bible study, it was asked, you know, is it, is it wrong then? He's saying it's wrong or, or is it judging somebody to say, you know, somebody isn't wearing yoda and they stink to say they stink? No, that's... Calling it what it is. The problem is your mind doesn't have breaks. And your mind's not content to stop there at the outside and call it what it is. Your mind wants to begin to cast judgment and turn it into, well, I know what, it's probably a lazy bum, whatever it may be. You come to conclusions in your own mind. You see people in line at the store and if they're using food stamps and EBT card. You observe that, that's the outside, but how many times does your mind put the brakes up right there and refuse to think about it any further? Not very often, Pastor. Your mind goes ahead and figures out exactly how they got there. You formulate a whole story in your mind on exactly what their life looks like with no details and not knowing anything. Even, even religious folks. So judgment again, to size up, to write off, to condemn or find fault. It is an unjust, critical attitude and an attitude of hypocrisy. Because I asked you at the beginning, was there anybody perfect here? Anybody without sin? No one dared raise their hand. And yet we'll raise the finger at others who aren't perfect. What ruler do you use? Look at your neighbor and ask him, what ruler do you use? Now go ahead and ask him. It'll be good later. You want to know. Because it's amazing to me that we all know that we're not perfect. But when somebody else isn't perfect, man, we're real quick to point that out. Even if we don't tell anybody else. I, I know people today that aren't in church. Because every church they go to, it's, a, it's amazing how quick they can find that people in that church aren't perfect either. And so I'm not going to church because they're a bunch of hypocrites. Or they'll get close to one person only to realize that person that they were friends with is actually a person and not Jesus. And they wasn't perfect. I said, well, I'm not going back to that church. They're hypocrites, and I love this. has just been great for me. Heard a preacher say a long time ago, I'd rather come to church and sit beside hypocrites than die and go to hell and sit beside all the hypocrites. That's the truth. You, you came for God. You didn't come for them. I didn't come today to preach to you. I didn't come today for you at all. I came for God. Whether you live right or don't, I'm going to love you. I'm not trying to judge you. I, I've, got, I've got my hands full trying to make sure that I stay right with God. I already know that I'm not perfect. I'm not interested in using a, a, a slide rule. Or some of us, we, we like to use a slide rule. We know that we're not perfect, but, but their stuff's so much bigger than ours. Their, their problems are so much worse. I used to be like that, but I'm not now. See, I'm... What, what, what do you measure with? Because even though we know that we're not perfect, isn't it amazing how quick we find fault with somebody else? And stumble over it, become offended with it, and it pushes us away from God. It grieves the Holy Spirit. It's unjust. It's critical. Hypocrisy. It leads to fault finding and condemnation. I want to 
share a couple of just stories just to show you how easily we are ensnared. A grocery store clerk once wrote to an advice columnist, Ann Landers, to complain about the people she saw coming through her line buying luxury food items like birthday cakes and bags of shrimp with their food stamps. The writer went on to say that she thought all those people on welfare who treated themselves to such nonsense and non-necessities were lazy and wasteful. A few weeks later, Lander's column was devoted entirely to the people who had responded to the grocery clerk. One woman wrote, I did not buy a cake but I did buy a bag of shrimp with my food stamps. My husband had been working at a plant for over 15 years when it shut down. And he lost his job, forcing us to go on food stamps. Never in our life had we been dependent on anyone. He became so impressed from not being able to find a job as quickly as he hoped or to provide for our family like he was accustomed to. And so discouraged about not being able to do anything for the children's birthday and or anything special for our 25th anniversary. So the shrimp I bought was for a shrimp casserole, his favorite dish, which I made for our 25th wedding anniversary dinner. And we ate it for three days. Hmm. How many times have we done something like that? Now here, here's the truth. There may be people that are taking advantage. I'm quite confident there are. My whole point is you don't know every situation. We, we judge people because we're afraid that they're getting away with something and that they, 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 should, they should be punished. And, and that they, uh, there should be justice. But you're not innocent. You can't afford justice. You better praise God for mercy. The wage of sin is death. They're not getting away with anything. God keeps good records and you don't have to help him. Another woman responded to this columnist. And she said, I am the woman who bought the $17 cake and paid for it with food stamps. I know that I am she because... I thought the checkout woman in the store would burn a hole through me with her eyes. But what she did not know was that cake was for my little girl's birthday and it would be her last. As her cancer had spread into her bones and the doctor said she had six to eight months left to live. I was in Kmart seven, eight years ago. My mother was disabled, had numerous strokes, and couldn't walk very well. At this time, she wasn't on a walker yet. And she had a handicap placard, but not a license plate. And rather than hanging it up from the mirror, she just left it on the dash. And I was driving her car, and I pulled into the handicap spot, and we got out, and I ushered my mother in. And no sooner had we made it into the door, we were probably no more than 10 feet. And two ladies came over and just went off on my mother. Probably one of the most angry moments of my life. About how dare she park in a handicap spot. My mother had a stroke in Kmart that day, a mini stroke. Because these women were relentless as I tried to explain to them, you misunderstand. And both of these women, neither one of them were disabled. I'm sure that it was personal to them because they had somebody. My mother collapsed into a rack of clothes and sat there and refused to move. And those women were still relentless. Probably the only reason I didn't lose my cool on those women that day is because I was too busy tending to my mom. Because they judge a situation before they stopped and got the facts. That one happened to hurt me. I wonder how many times silently I've hurt someone else. 
because I was so convinced. The truth is, in this room, every one of us have been on the wrong end of that stick at times. Where people have talked behind our back and they've already formulated an opinion about what we said or what we meant or what we did or what we didn't do. And how it's hurt you before that you, you've had people that, that, that bought into something without all the facts. And even with the best of intentions, they, 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 they judged. And, and you were the one hurt. Even if you could straighten it all out, it still hurts. If those women were to come up to me today and profusely apologize, it wouldn't change what they have done. I forgive, but it still hurt. It certainly wasn't very Christ-like. Now, they didn't come up and say, we're Christians from the local Lexington Church of God, just want to give you a, a good ripping. But there was nothing Christ-like about any of that. But I think sometimes we do the same thing. And hear me this morning. The Holy Spirit's just as grieved when you do it out loud as when you do it internally. And you walk out of that store and you, you bit your tongue and you feel good as a Christian because you didn't give them a piece of your mind. You just grieved the Holy Spirit because you were thinking it in your heart. The Bible says this. When a man looks at a woman to lust and he's already conceived adultery in his heart, he said, you've already committed the act. It's an issue of the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. One man said it this way, only God is in a position to look down on anybody. The truth is we, we do cast judgment. And here's why it matters, guys. We, we cast judgment on all kinds of things. If we stand in line by somebody, like I said, that they're, they're not wearing deodorant. If they're dressed nice, we, we may cast a different judgment. Just picture this in your mind. You stand beside somebody in a three-piece suit. Look like it could be in a magazine. But he smells of body odor. You assume, man, he must have, must have been outside walking through the parking lot for a while. Must have had a meeting outside. You take the person behind you with that same body odor and their clothes are tattered and torn and the shoes have holes in them. You probably assume the same thing as you did that guy in the three-piece suit. He's probably been in a long business meeting today. You know, your mind jumps to a conclusion. You start sniffing. You got alcohol on his breath, too. Probably a bum. Isn't it amazing? Why the difference? Because you, you judged the book by its cover. You saw something on the outside. Your mind could have put the brakes on when you smelled that and said, you know, this is a little strong. But your mind doesn't stop there. The Holy Spirit lives inside. You and I ought to look different. We ought to act different. We ought to respond different. When you realize other people around you have imperfections, how often do you say, well, you know what? Praise God, such was I without Christ. Now you pull out that slide ruler. And what their issue is, I I've seen people get offended and leave church before because somebody in the church said an ugly word. Got enough. Tiff with the family member. Not necessarily in the church. But then somebody else that knew them said, oh my, I can't believe. And they go to church talking like that. Well, turn it back on you. You never lost your cool. I'm not condoning. I'm just asking. Because if you're going to use that ruler, just know that one day God's going to take your ruler. I mean, it doesn't get any more fair than that. One day God's going to take your ruler and say, let's, let's, let's see how you measure up to your ruler. That's what the scripture is telling us. Was there never a time where, where maybe you had been out in the sun too long and your body odor got the better of you? Is it, is that the, why does that matter? Because when we judge people like that, it changes the way that we witness to them. 
We, 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 we run into somebody at the store that's got alcohol on their breath or maybe even a family member that we know is an addict. We begin to think in our mind, they don't want to hear the message. We know that they need Jesus and we may even ask the preacher to pray for them, but we don't invite them because we know they don't want to hear it. Have you ever caught yourself thinking that about somebody? They don't want to hear it. But you know, you, you the church, you know Jesus is the answer. Jesus is what they need. You cast judgment in your mind that they don't want to hear it. They wouldn't receive it. They'd be offended. They'd get mad. Let me be, let me be real with you. Sometimes the reason that we don't invite our own family is because we would be embarrassed if they actually came. You don't get to pick your family and all of us have people in our family or our extended family that while they need Jesus, they're not people that we want all of our friends to know that they're our family member. So, so your judgment has already... You're the Christian. Listen, you, you understand the point of this? How you grieve the Holy Spirit? Do you not see that Jesus would have died for them? He wouldn't be embarrassed with them? The Bible says that Jesus sat and dined with sinners and publicans. And can I tell you who got upset about it? It was the religious folks. One such story. A woman with an alabaster box, not invited, heard that Jesus was in town and, and eating in, in this man's house. This man had invited Jesus in. This woman comes in unannounced, uninvited, with this very expensive perfume. Breaks open that alabaster box. Begins to weep at the feet of Jesus as she poured it on him. She begins to cry and wipe his feet with her tears. And kiss it on his feet. And the man that had invited him, the religious man. At the end of the table, though he never spoke a word in his heart. Began to cast judgment. And he said this in his heart. He said, if, if he truly was. A prophet. If, if this Jesus really knew anything, he'd know what manner of woman this was. Many believe that she was a prostitute. In his mind, he began to say things like, if Jesus really was the son of God, if he was really a prophet, he'd know that she's just a hooker. And Jesus, perceiving the thoughts, withstood the assault. That was an attack on Christ. If Jesus knew, he would know better. And then as the man continued, though he never spoke a word, continued in his heart to judge. He crossed the line with the Lord when he began to speculate what a waste it was for her, that extravagant gift to be poured out in such a way. And Jesus, knowing the thoughts, Jesus stopped and said, let me ask you a question. Suppose a man had a $5 debt that he owed. And someone said, you, you're forgiven. You don't have to pay me back at all. And another one had a $500,000 debt that he owes. And the bank said, you're forgiven. You don't owe the debt at all. Which, which one do you suppose would be more grateful? Well, certainly the one that has the $500,000 debt. He said, you, you've answered correctly. He said, let, let me tell you something. You want to judge. He said, you, you invited me here. Christian, you, you invited him here. He said, but when I showed up as your guest, you, you didn't even offer water for me to wash my feet. But she who wasn't invited came in and has not stopped washing my feet. And, and by the way, she didn't use any of your water. She's using her tears and her hair. And, and you who in, invited me here, you, you didn't even so much as greet me when I came through the door. You, you didn't greet me with a kiss. And she's not stopped kissing my feet since she came in. You're quick to cast judgment, but you, you forget what you need. You need salvation. You forget where you've come from. How can you, with a plank in your eye, look and say to someone else, you, you've got this little issue. You know, if you get this straightened out in your life, you know, if you just fix this, you know, if, if you just listen to me here. He said, You've got to deal with the 
beam in your own eye first. Then you'll be able to see clearly. I, I'm convinced he, he wasn't saying that your sin is bigger than theirs. What he was saying is your self-righteousness, the fact that you can't acknowledge or remember that you're not perfect, even though you know it, the fact that you can't confess it and own it in that moment, that, but for the grace of God, you are no different. You can, you can be in church and you are just as lost without Jesus as the most heinous of criminals. You are doomed to a devil's hell just as much as any murderer, just as much as any rapist or any pedophile. But when you use that slide rule, it makes you feel better that you're not like them. But for the grace of God, you absolutely were. He said, if, you, if you'll acknowledge that and you get the beam out of your own, then you'll be able to see clearly. Let, let me tell you, it, it doesn't matter, guys. Listen, it, it doesn't matter what other people are doing or not doing or getting away with. At the end of the day, you are only accountable to God for your sin. And I promise you God keeps good records. Nobody's getting away with anything. One day every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And the Bible even goes so far as to say this even for you and I. That one day we'll give an account for every idle word. Even those sins that you, you thought you got away with and that nobody knows about. But God still saw and God does know about. Judgment begins here. Examine your own self first. Listen. What kind of church would, would we be if we would be a people who would be more worried about keeping our heart pure and blameless before God than we were worried about what somebody else is doing or not doing or what somebody said or what happened with somebody? Even in church, friends, we are, we are more interested in the latest gossip than we are the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you what we're supposed to do instead of judge? We're to love. We're to love. Jesus sat at the table with sinners and publicans because he loved. Even the ones the world despised, he loved. That's what made it different. That's what drew people to him. I tell you that, that, that people are drawn like a moth to the flame to people that will glorify God. What is that flame? It's love. In 1 Corinthians 13, he says, if you do all of these things and you're so religious and you're perfect, you come to church every Sunday and you preach the gospel, but you don't have love, it's all for nothing. You can go around and knock on every door in your neighborhood and talk about how great God is and how wonderful your church is and the amazing things God can do. And then you can spoil it all at a restaurant over a glass of tea when you lose your testimony because you don't have the love. See, the love is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the evidence that the Spirit lives in you. What I'm telling you is the Holy Spirit wants to clean house, make it a place acceptable where He can live, where He can set up His abode. Because if I cannot operate in you and through you, if you won't surrender to me that area of love where I can show the world who I am and that I love them, I cannot dwell there. I will not stay there. You grieve the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you're my disciple, that you love one another. You, you, can, you can know that somebody has an issue in their life. You can know that they've got a speck in their eye, but you can refuse to judge it. Jesus sat with sinners and publicans. He knew that there were issues in their life, but he refused to judge. To judge is to, to sum them up in order to write them off. He didn't write anybody off. He refused to condemn. And yet the same Jesus looked at religious leaders and he said, You act just like your dad, the devil. Now, in that judgment, basically, he just said, you're not even saved. Isn't that just, no, your, your actions, I, I refuse to condemn you. I'm not, I'm not summing you up so that I can do away with you. I'm not condemning you. I didn't come to condemn. I'm pointing out the reality is this, but my arms are still open wide. You think Jesus didn't know what manner of woman this was? Absolutely, he knew. 
And yet he loved anyway. He refused to judge. The woman caught in the act of adultery who was drugged to him. Jesus doodled something in the dirt when they're adamant that she be killed, stoned, that the law be observed. He says, all right, that's a great idea. Who's innocent? Throw the first stone. You, you without sin, go ahead, let's do this thing. And nonchalantly kneels back down, not even paying attention. I mean, I guess if anybody in the crowd would have been bold enough, they could have went ahead and cast a stone. I ask you at the beginning, is anybody here perfect? Anybody without sin? So if you know you're not, then you don't have the opportunity, you don't have the ability not to be blameless before God and cast a stone at anyone. No matter how big it is, no matter how bad it is, even if the people in the store are doing exactly what you think they're doing in there, they're abusing the system, then let God handle it. So that you will be blameless and you cover them in love because love may be the very thing that wins them over to Christ. I've noticed that people are drawn to people that they think care about them. People want to be around people that they know love them. You think back, you know, when you were, you were a kid or maybe there's kids around you in your, at this stage in your life. And whether it's an aunt or an uncle or grandma or whatever. If, if they know that you love them or they feel like you care. You're the highlight of the week if they get to come to your house. Because you care about them. I've discovered even grown-ups today, it's like the old saying, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Here's, here's the way we try and win people sometimes. It's the cousin, the uncle, the brother, the sister, our spouse. You know, if you don't straighten up, you're going to go to hell. They already know that. The difference is when, when mama goes in that back bedroom and she's praying, and I can hear her prayers out loud and she's weeping in that back bedroom. God save my boy. God don't let my son die and go to hell. I, I hear love. I don't hear condemnation. I hear love. A broken heart of a mother. When I realized my own dad wasn't saved and I had failed miserably to even attempt to minister to him. When I began that conversation, I didn't tell him, Daddy, you, you know you're going to die and go to hell. I said, Daddy, I love you. You know that I love you. And because I love you, I cannot bear the thought of you spending eternity any other place than with God. If I would have told my father that, Daddy, you know if you don't start living right, you're going to die. He already knew. And he just shut down the gospel. It's not our place to judge. It's our place to love. Love is that fruit of the Spirit. He said, because with the same ruler you use, God will use to judge you one day. And this is powerful because you, you have the key today to the grace of God for you. See, people do something, and, and, and it, it may, in the context, really be something small, but to us, it's a, it's a big deal. This is huge. There are people that have said things about you behind your back, and you found out, and it's a big deal. You've been around people in the church and they've let you down because they didn't turn out to look anything like Jesus. And, it, and it's a big deal and it hurt you because you, you judged them. And one day when you stand before the Lord and God says, you know, you remember that time that you talked about somebody behind their back? Let's, let's use your ruler. Well, no, God, that's, no, no, no. It's, let's just use your ruler. Let's stick with your measuring device. Nobody's ever done this, but you've known people that do. Did you see what she wore to church? Did you see that? People wear that to church? I can only imagine what God may say one day on that day of judgment. He pulls out your ruler and says, Do you remember that time you said this was the standard for what we wear? And God says, Do you remember that time you went to the lake? And that, that bathing suit you had on? 
Well, no, no, God, that's it. God, that wasn't the church. No, no, no. Let's use, let's use your ruler. If we're, going, if we're going to measure clothes, let's use your ruler and measure them. You could have chosen to let your mind stop with the obvious and leave it to God to judge and, and love that individual that came to church that maybe didn't know better. I wonder how many people have been run out of church before because somebody made sure they let them know that they didn't look right when they got there. Maybe they didn't know that until you told them. And praise the Lord that they met you, not you, others. And so the reason they're not in church today is because they didn't find love when they walked through the door. They found an awfully short ruler that left no room for them. You can take that same thing and all of a sudden, it, it, with a different ruler, it really isn't that big a deal. Some things in life, when they're covered with just a little bit more grace, all of a sudden, you, you know, it's not a big deal. There's a song we sing, as long as I got King Jesus, it says, I've been lied on. Every time they say that, I think, man, if you only knew the lies that's been told about the pastor and the people that have been hurt through the years because people make up stories sometimes, just flat out make them up. Here's what I do every time. God, I don't even want to get a ruler out. I'm not going to judge that person. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It's not my place. I want to love them. I've had people at this church hurt me very, very dearly, very deeply. And I've refused to cut them back. Some of them have left and some have come back. All because I made sure there was room for grace. I'm not perfect. Hear me this morning. But I know that I'm a sinful man. And I know that I'm far from perfect. And the last thing I want to do is limit the grace. God's given me, listen, this, this is only three foot. There's 300 feet on this. All of a sudden, this really doesn't look like that big a deal at all. Been lied on. Been done wrong. People hurt me. Those ladies at Kmart. But God, here's what I want. I want to have, I can't do this in my flesh, but I want the Holy Spirit to give me a fresh supply of grace every day. Because if I don't, it'll poison my soul. I'll become bitter about things that people have done and people have said. Because I won't offer any grace and I'll, I'll make sure that, that they get what they deserve, God. And, and, and I want you to know, Lord, that how big a deal this was. You, you know what they said about me, God. You know how they hurt me, Lord. He, he, they got to be punished. There, there's no, they can't get away with this. There's no room for this, God. And one day when that's all you've left God to judge you by, I thank God. Even as he hung on the cross, Father, forgive them. I'm only 41 years into this, but I've never run out of the grace of God. And I can tell you, every day I fail him miserably. And yet every day God extends more grace. I feel like I use at least 300 feet of line every day. And I don't know where it comes from, but I know this. God's never even run low on it. Stand with me all over the house. Every head bowed and every eye closed. All of us in here know that we're not perfect. But what you don't understand is that if you'll let the Holy Spirit move in you, and the evidence of Him living in you, the fruit of the Spirit, that love really is allowed to move and to operate in your life as it did through Christ Jesus. And I know that you're not Jesus, but God's still God. He said, know you not that you're the temple, you're the dwelling place. And the same Jesus that sat and dined with sinners and publicans, if you let God have His way, all of a sudden you'll find out that there's a whole lot more grace in your heart than you ever thought. 
And like moths to a flame, people will be compelled to know the God that you serve. What's different about you? Why do you treat me like this? Why are you so nice to me? Why do you love me when nobody else likes me? Through the years, I've met some very bitter people. And in a few of those situations, I have been able to love them to the point of breaking down walls. And had men or had women weep. Why are you nice to me? And it breaks my heart to hear that everybody's always been mean to them, even though I can see sometimes why. I refuse to judge and I refuse to shorten the ruler of grace because I don't know the story. I don't know why they're bitter. I don't know what they've been through. Here's what I know. Jesus loves them just like he loved me. I want to ask everybody that's here this morning, if you'll come find a spot, pray. I know each week these messages are They're very convicting and very personal. And sometimes we may feel ashamed to come because it it almost feels like an admission of guilt. But the reality is every one of us in here are guilty of everything that we've preached on. The Holy Spirit simply desiring to clean the temple. I want to invite you to find a spot and pray. If you don't feel like this message was for you, then intercede for others. That God fill us with love. Fill me with you. I don't want to be ashamed of my family. I don't want to judge the lost God. I I don't want anything to be a stumbling block for the gospel. All over this house, would you come and pray as we worship together? Hallelujah. Search me.
morning, God, that in your Holy Spirit continue to cleanse the temple our heart, God. If there's anything in us, Lord, anything in me that would cause the light of Jesus Christ to dimly shine, anything in me, God, that would hinder the quench of the Spirit, I pray, Lord, that you would have your way. Remove it, God. Reveal it to me. Expose it. Or give me a heart, Lord, of repentance to turn away from these things that would grieve you. I pray, Lord, not only for me, but for this body that you would so fill us with the love of Jesus Christ. That that love compel us, Lord, to go the extra mile. That love, God, would compel us, Lord, to unashamedly testify of your goodness. That that love, God, which keeps no record of right and wrong, that love, God, would be seen to all men. Let it be that love that is the flame that draws me into you. And Lord, I give you the praise for this day, for this word. Lord, I ask today that this word will be given in our heart, God. As we depart from this place today, may we do so in the peace and the power of that almighty name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you.